Welcome to the congregation of Yahweh. We're here on uh, the, the Feast of Tabernacles. And today, I'm going to touch on a part two of, of what I was discussing yesterday concerning baptism and uh, our call to surrender. And when we surrender our lives, when we truly say, I give up and I'm ready to live for you, there should be fruit seen in our lives. There should be evidence. And just a little recap, you know, I said that we don't change ourselves to come to Him. We surrender ourselves and become willing for Him to change us. And, uh, but before before I uh, talk about death of the old nature and resurrection of a new nature, I want to discuss a little bit more about John the Baptist. One second. There we go. Uh, I'm going to pick up at Matthew chapter 17. <clears throat> And, uh, you know, yesterday I covered John's call. He was calling people to be baptized, the baptism of repentance. But he said that the one that came after him would baptize people with the Spirit. And uh, in Matthew 17... Actually, the, the last verse of 16, Yeshua said, Verily I say unto you, There be some standing here which shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. And in the next chapter, we have the vision of the transfiguration. Yeshua is glowing, and with Him appears Moses and Elijah, and Peter, James, and John here were seeing a vision of what the second coming will look like when Yeshua returns with the law and the prophets, Moses and Elijah. And I'm going to pick up in verse 9. And as they came down from the mountain, Yeshua charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Eliah must first come? And Yeshua answered and said unto them, Eliah truly shall come first and restore all things. Keep that in mind. He said Elijah will, he truly will come and restore all things. But I say unto you that Eliah is come already, and knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. So, did John the Baptist restore all things? His message was a message of restoration. And he was preparing the hearts of the people. And I discussed yesterday that those who were affected by John's message repented and were baptized and received the baptism of Yeshua. But the religious leaders who were self-righteous did not receive John's message and were not baptized. And the same religious, religious leaders were the ones that rejected the Messiah and have, had him turned over to Pilate. Uh, verse 13, Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. So when he said, Elijah is come already, he was referring to John. Matthew chapter 11, and verse 11, Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if you will receive it, this is Eliah, 
which was for to come. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. When you hear that phrase, he that has ear to hear, let him hear, that means something deeper is going on. Something we really need to pay attention to here. Where are they getting this from that Elijah is to come? Malachi chapter 4. Now, I'm going to read this whole chapter for context. And it's amazing where these verses that we're going to zoom in on take place. Chapter 4, verse 1. For behold, the day comes that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud. Now, I didn't say some proud. It says all of the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that comes shall burn them up. So a time is coming when all proud and all that do wicked shall be stubble and they will be burned up. Saith Yahweh of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings and you shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. But you shall tread down the wicked for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet. A time is coming when the wicked, the lawless, the rebellious will be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this saith Yahweh of hosts. Now, keeping in mind what we just read, a time in the future when this is going to happen, the next verse says, Remember the law of Moses my servant. Why would he make a connection between those two things? There's a lot of mainstream religious circuses out there that want to do away with the commandments of the Most High that were given to Moses, His Word that endures forever. They want to do away with it. They only want to make it applicable to a small group of people. They want to say that it was fulfilled so we don't have to. They want to say He did it so we don't. But there is a connection between remembering the law of Moses and this day that comes that shall burn as an oven where the wicked and the proud will be ashes under the soles of your feet. And then, he says that, you know, he gave this law unto him at Horeb for all of Israel with the statutes and judgments. If you properly interpret the Messianic scriptures, you know who Israel is. Israel is the olive tree and those who are grafted to the olive tree if you're in the Messiah, you're the seed of Abraham and heirs according to the promise. You're a fulfillment of the sand and the stars. But right after this, he says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of Yahweh. Now, there's another verse I'm going to read in a minute. It says that John the Baptist came in the spirit and power of Elijah. Yep, John was filled with the spirit from his mother's womb. But I, I think it's very clear that the coming of Elijah is fulfilled twofold. That John the Baptist came in the spirit and power of Elijah, but Elijah will also come before the great and dreadful day. And I believe it's the spirit and power of Elijah. It's the message of John the Baptist. And I believe that we're in those days as we speak. Continuing on in verse 6. This Elijah that will come, and the reason I believe it's the spirit and power 
of Elijah is because John the Baptist also came in the spirit and power of Elijah. And it's quite possible that this ties in with the early rain and the latter rain. But Elijah that comes before the great and dreadful day, he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. And I discussed yesterday that this is not daddy turning his heart to his children. This is the heart of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob returning to the covenant people. And the covenant people turning their hearts to the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And what did Abraham do? Abraham, according to Genesis 26 verse 5, he obeyed my voice, my commandments, my statutes, and my judgments. Long before Mount Sinai, Abraham was an obedient man. Long before Israel was called a nation, before a Jew even existed, Abraham was an obedient man and his faith was accounted unto him for righteousness. And that faith was proven by his actions. According to James, if your actions, if your works don't follow, your faith is of no use. But through works, your faith is made perfect. So if our faith is genuine, it shall be seen. Which is why he said, show me your faith without your works. I will show you my faith by my works. Luke chapter 1, an angel prophesied of this coming child, John the Baptist. Chapter 1 and verse 13, But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of Yahweh, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. And he shall be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall turn to Yahweh their Elohim. So, because of John's birth and his mission, many of the children of Israel shall turn to Yahweh. How do we turn to Yahweh? We turn to a life of obedience. We turn from a life of disobedience and a rebellious heart to the hearts of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That is what it means for the children to turn to Yahweh. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. John's mission was to turn the disobedient back to Yahweh and to make ready a people prepared for Yahweh. How does he make the people ready? By turning their hearts back to the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the people that received his message, the people that were baptized unto repentance, were prepared for the Messiah. And in these last days, this last Elijah message, the message of repentance, he is preparing his people for a second return of the Messiah. The second Elijah message is preparing the people for a second coming of Messiah. And the message is the same as the first. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Because somebody's about to come whose shoes latch it. We're not worthy to loose. But we need to be in a constant state of repentance and obedience. In Luke chapter 3, we, we touched on that yesterday. But as John the Baptist is going out, in uh, verse 3, he came into all the country about Jordan preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Repentance for the remission of sins was not a new doctrine. Go back uh, to the book of Ezekiel. It says, if a righteous man forsakes his righteousness and walks in wickedness his righteousness will be forgotten 
But if a wicked man turns from his wickedness and walks in righteousness, his wickedness will be forgotten. This was no new message. He was telling the people to turn from your wickedness and repent so that your sins can be forgiven. But the one that's coming after me, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, will empower you. As it is written in the book of the, of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of Yahweh. Make his paths straight. Prepare the people for Yahweh. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be brought low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways shall be made smooth. I touched on this a little bit together. This is the people and the religious leaders who John came to fill and to rebuke, to make the path straight, and all flesh shall see the salvation of Yahweh. And as a matter of fact, he's about these groups. The valley, the empty shall be filled. The mountain, the lofty shall be brought low. The crooked, the crooked religious leaders, he's going to make them straight through rebuke. And the rough ways, he's going to make it smooth. Verse 7, Then said he unto the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance, and begin not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you, The Elohim is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. So the people go on to say, What do we need to do? There's three groups of people here. Uh, the people asked, what do we do? He said, if you got two, co two coats, give to him that does not have. And if you got food, do the same thing. The publicans asked what they needed to do. And he said unto them, exact no more than that which is appointed to you. The soldiers asked what we needed to do. And they said, do no violence to any man. Do not accuse anyone falsely and be, a, be content with your wages. What he's saying here is show fruit worthy of repentance. These things are changes of heart. These are acts of love. The Bible says that love is the fulfillment of the law. The mainstream interprets that as if we love, we don't need to keep the law. But what it actually means is love is the completion. It's the missing element. The law can only tell you what's wrong. It cannot change the heart. And it's the spirit that comes into your life that manifests the spiritual application to his word. In Matthew chapter 5, he said, "If you, uh, the law says, do not commit adultery. But I tell you, if you look on a woman to lust after her in your, your heart, you've committed adultery already. The spiritual application of his, of his word was the missing element. So when we truly surrender and we ask Him of His Spirit and we receive His Spirit, that Spirit comes to dwell with us. Uh, I believe there's a verse of Revelation that says, If you knock, I and my Father will come in and abide with you and suck with you. The presence of the Most High and His Son will come to live inside of you. And as Brother Brant mentioned earlier, we are His temple. The temple contains his presence. And that presence is what causes the darkness to expel from our lives when the Spirit convicts us of sin and roots out things that are not of him. He makes the unclean clean. And Ezekiel 36 talks about this heart transplant. Ezekiel 36 and verse 26. A new heart also I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. It's the spirit that he puts inside of you that causes you to obey. And you will keep my statutes 
You will walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. Let's go over to um, Romans chapter 6. And Paul is going to give us a little bit deeper understanding about submission of the Spirit and getting rid of the old nature. See, all of us are born with a death sentence on us because we are transgressors. We have inherited a fallen nature. We have, have inherited a death sentence. And like the song we read earlier, He has provided a way. You can pay for your own sins or you can receive a free gift. Uh, Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of of Yahweh Romans 6 and 23 for the wages of sin is death but the gift of Elohim is eternal life through Yeshua Messiah our master somebody's gonna pay for the wages of sin we can pay for our own or we can receive the free gift and if we choose him he will empower us to be an obedient people and it's not our obedience that get it. <laughs> it's His obedience. And if we receive that free gift, He will empower us. Chapter 6 and verse 1. Now, we talked about John's baptism, calling the people to repent. But we need to be baptized in the Spirit, immersed in the Spirit, indwelled with the Spirit. And that's going to change us. That's the new heart and the new mind that we just read about. Chapter 6, verse 1. Shall, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Since we know about this grace, can we just keep living in wickedness so that His grace will be that much more? Certainly not. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? We need to know what it means to be dead to sin. Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Yeshua, Messiah, were baptized into His death. Therefore, we are buried with Him by baptism into death, that like as Messiah was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we all should walk in newness of life. If this has truly taken place in our lives, there should be an obvious change. If you have not had a change of heart and mind, you're missing something. There is a disconnect. If you're still living the way you used to live, there is a disconnect. It says that just as He was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together, planted down together in the likeness of His death, we shall be also in the likeness of His resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man, our old nature, our old rebellious nature is crucified or impaled with Him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. That henceforth we should not serve sin. If you are still a slave to sin, there's a disconnect. We're missing something. If you're still in bondage to a sinful lifestyle and you're not being loosed from it, there's a disconnect. We're missing something. Let me read a couple scriptures about the evidence of this actually taking place. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Messiah, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. If those old things haven't passed away, there's a disconnect. If the Holy Spirit is not convicting you of things that are wrong in your life, there's a disconnect. Uh, Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5 
and verse 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. If the lusts of the flesh still have a hold on you, you're not walking in the Spirit. Because if you walk in the Spirit, you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary, the one to the other, so you cannot do the things that you want to. But if you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. We're going to touch on that in a minute. If you're walking in the Spirit, the law does not have its finger pointing at you. And you're not under the condemnation of it. For instance, the law says don't commit adultery. If you're walking in the Spirit, you're not going to commit adultery. But if you are committing adultery, the law has its finger pointing at you and you're under the condemnation of it. So once He sets, once he sets you free from the works of the flesh, which are identified by the law, you're not under the law anymore because it's not pointing its finger at you. We'll get a little deeper on that here in just a minute. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like of the which I tell you before as I have also told you in time past that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of Yahweh. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. If you are walking in the Spirit, there is no law that can condemn you. And they that are Messiahs, there's that evidence, they that are the Messiahs have impaled the flesh. That means they've put the flesh to death with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. Back to Romans chapter 6. Verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man has been crucified with him, if your old nature, now I'm a, I'm, I can speak for myself because, you know, I know myself, I know where I've been. I used to be a party animal. I would party for two and three days at a time, eating pills, snorting cocaine, and chugging hard liquor like it was water. I would walk around parties with a fifth in my hand and it would be empty before the night was over with. I would stay up all night on cocaine, take a little nap, wake up and do it again. And I know that man is dead. He is in the ground and he is not inside of me. He is gone. He is no more. But if there's anything you used to do that still has a hold on you, an addiction, a bondage, a craving, it has to die. But if the Spirit tells you that that part of you has to die, and you don't listen to it, you're going to get numb. And you're not going to hear the Spirit anymore. That is a dangerous position to be in. If you have a calling from the Spirit that tells you to get rid of something, praise Yahweh that you still have that call on your life. Hallelujah. But if you've got things in your life that are contradictory to this Word, and you don't hear the call, we need to drop to our knees and pray for Him to give us that conviction again. Because that's the restart button. Fall into your knees. It says in 1 John, If we sin, we have an advocate who's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But we have to ask. It says if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But if we don't identify that sin and we don't confess that sin, we're in danger. 
So, so far I've read a few evidences, proof that we're truly in the Messiah. The flesh, the lusts, the affections, the old nature, the old creature need to be dead. The new creature, walking in the Spirit, having the fruits of the Spirit are proof that we're truly in the Messiah. The old man, verse 6 says, the old man has been crucified. That means the person that you used to be went up to the torture stake, to the cross, and was left there with him. And that gift, when we say, I surrender to you, I want of your spirit, right then there should be a change in heart and mind and the person that you used to be should be transferred to the stake and left in the ground. But at any point in time, if you want to go back and feed the old man and feed the old lusts, you have the power to resurrect him because Yahweh is not going to take your will from you. We have free will. But if we truly want to be set free, we can surrender. We can ask for forgiveness. We can ask for the convicting power of His Holy Spirit to resurrect us. He, taught, he told the Jews in, in John chapter 8 how to be set free. In chapter 8 and verse 30, And He spake these words, Many believed on Him. Then said Yeshua to those Jews which believed on Him, if you continue in my word, you got to continue in his word. If you continue, you will be my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. It's continuing in his word, because his word is the truth, that sets you free. But sets you free from what? What do we need to be set free from? Our old nature? Sin, rebellion, but let me tell you where you find that. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed. They had to go trusting in their bloodline again. We be Abraham's seed and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, You shall be made free? Yeshua answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever commits sin is a slave of sin. If we're living in sin, we are slaves. We are in bondage to sin. And we know that sin is transgression of His instructions. I say it all the time. I'll say it one more time. Romans chapter 3 verse 20. By the law is the knowledge of sin. Romans chapter 4 verse 15. Where there is no law, there is no transgression. 1 John chapter 3 verse, verse uh, 4. Sin is transgression of the law. Romans chapter 7 verse 6, I had not known lust except the law had said thou shalt not covet. If you want to know what sin is, you got to know His Word. But knowing His Word is the key to be setting free from a life of sin after He pours out His Spirit into your life and empowers you to obey. There comes a point in time, let me give you a, a, a little testimony. I had been set free from cigarettes for eight months. Didn't need them. Didn't have a craving for them. I started hanging out with other people that smoked. Guilt by association. I was feeding my flesh with their presence when they were blowing smoke in my face. And I gave in to temptation. I said, man, let me have a drag off your cigarette. I took one drag off that cigarette and I was hooked. That's how sin works. Just like that. Guilt by association and feeding your mind and your flesh with their presence. It works like that with pornography. It works like that with sexual sins. It works like that with addiction. It works like that with stealing. If you've got a stealing problem, don't hang out in stores a lot. Okay? If you've got a pornography or sexual addiction, don't hang out in strip clubs. If you've got an addiction to tobacco or alcohol or whatever it is, you need to keep that stuff away from you. But after I fed my flesh with that addiction, that uncleanness, and I said, man, let me have some of what you've got. 
I surrendered my will to that. I surrendered, surrendered it up. And the tobacco companies put about 400 chemicals in it to make sure you don't surrender your will because they know that's all it takes. But at the, uh, for weeks, I couldn't give it up. I was in bondage. Every time I smelled a cigarette, every time I saw somebody with a cigarette in my mouth, I wanted to crawl, this is in prison by the way, I wanted to get down on my knees and pick up other people's butts. That's how unclean it was. That's how strong the addiction was. And I knew if I went and bought some cigarettes, it'd be 10 times worse. So I was, I felt like the sun that was crawling around in the hog's trough. That's what I felt like. And I cried out, Father Yahweh, I know I brought myself back in bondage. What can I do? And he spoke to my heart just as plain as day. He said, you can't do anything without me. That's the key, ladies and gentlemen. That's the key to over... And I'm not putting my finger on tobacco today. I'm putting my, my finger on anything that is in rebellion against Yahweh. Any sin that you have in your life. Any lust that is tugging at your mind. The key is Him. And realizing that you can't do it on your own in your own strength. That's where the victory is at. When you say... And that's what happened. When he told me you can't do anything without me, you got to ask me to take it. I went to the first pastor I could find and I said, I want you to pray for me and I'm going to confess that I don't have power over this thing and I need his power in my life. And as that pastor was praying for me, I said, Father, I realize I brought myself into bondage. I realize I do not have power over this thing. And I pray for your power to come in and empower me to obey you. I haven't smoked a cigarette since. It was three, about three weeks of continuous thoughts of bondage that I couldn't shake. And from that moment, I was set free. And he gave me the mindset back that that was unclean and I didn't want to touch it. He brought that conviction back. And I've, I've struggled a couple times since then. I've picked up dip. i picked up tobacco. But thank Yahweh, He continued to give me that conviction that it was wrong, that it was addictive, and that it was overpowering my temple that He was trying to indwell. He was trying to fill me with His Spirit, but I was filling it with poison. And any sin that we have in our life, any bondage, when you realize that it's overpowering you, all you got to do is ask. He said, if anyone asks, won't that good Father give you of His Spirit? But He warns us, don't grieve the Spirit. Don't quench the Spirit. That word quench is putting out a fire. And He wants to be a fire burning in our temple consuming away the stubble and the things that are being put on the foundation that will fall away. We need to build on this foundation stone. And that house that Messiah talked about that wouldn't be me, that wouldn't be moved, it was built on the rock. And he said that that rock is my word. Hallelujah. Going back to uh, Romans chapter 6. I'm going to close out here in just a few minutes. So in verse chapter 6, verse 6, we see that the old man, the old nature has to die. And in verse 7, it says, For he that is dead is freed from sin. If your old nature truly dies, the reason you're set free from sin is because that's the one that wants to sin. That's the one that wants to transgress. And if he's dead, you're not living in sin anymore. The law's not condemning you anymore. 
Now if we be dead with Messiah, we believe that we shall also live with Him. I'm gonna, for the sake of time, I'm going to scroll through. Verse 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. Where does sin rule from? According to this verse, it rules in your body. The flesh and lust and passion come from right here in your body, in your mind. Don't let sin reign in your mind. And how do we do that? Corinthians says, take your thoughts captive to the obedience of Messiah. When your thoughts say, I want to go to the prostitute. When your thoughts say, I need to go to the liquor store. When your thoughts say, I need to steal something that doesn't belong to me. Take that thought captive and make it obey you through the power of His Spirit. And I know a lot of people haven't gone down that road, but people might hear this on the internet someday. The further down that road of sin you have been, the more rooted and grounded in this Word you need to be. Because you have opened doors of temptation that other people have not. When I was out there selling drugs, other drug dealers would come around me and wave crack in my face. Because if you've ever smoked crack and somebody waves it in your face, you're going to go figure out how you can get some of it. They were testing me to see if I had opened that door. So any door of sin and temptation in your life is always going to be a door that the enemy uses. And Father, help those that have opened the most doors. And they need to be rooted and grounded in the Word that much more. Your safeguard. It says that in 15, Corinthians 15.33, evil communications corrupts good manners, good habits, good behaviors. It is our association that will protect us. We have no business out there in the world unless His light is spewing from our mouths and from our lives. Because that light coming from your life expels the darkness. They either want that light that you got or they want to get away from you because they can't stand it. John says that the light will not come. Excuse me. The darkness will not come to the light because its deeds will be manifest. Because the darkness loved the light. Excuse me. The darkness loved darkness rather than light. Why don't I just go there and read the whole thing? John chapter 3. Let's get the word right. John chapter 3 and verse 16. For Yahweh so loved the world. Didn't say He loved some people. Didn't say He loved a chosen few. It says He loved the whole world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever would believe in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For Yahweh sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through Him might be saved. He that believes on Him is not condemned. But he that believes not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of Yahweh. And this is condemnation, that light is come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that does evil hates the light, neither comes to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that does truth, his word is truth. He that does truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be manifest, that they are wrought in Elohim. And the reason I went there is because our only business out there in the world is to share the light. Other than that, we need to be with Yahweh's people. We need to be in Yahweh's Word. We need to be communing with Yahweh's Spirit and in prayer. And for those people that have opened all those doors in their life, that is your safeguard. Until you give your last breath, you need to be in this Word and in prayer, in spirit and in fellowship with other believers. And when I find people who have opened them doors, 
and they don't have a hunger and thirst for this, I fear for them. I fear for their soul. I fear for their mental health. And I fear where they're going to go in their life. Because if you have opened those doors, you're in danger until you get rooted and grounded in this Word. David said, Thy Word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against Thee. When I read that, that says, Thy Word have I hid in my heart that I don't go back out there to that club no more. Thy Word have I hid in my heart that I don't go back up there and pick up that drink or that drug or go start stealing stuff again to get my fix. Thy Word have I hid in my heart to protect me from myself and the world out there that hates me. Ladies and gentlemen, there's, there's two groups of people in this world. Those that receive Him and those that don't. Those who are empowered by Him and those who are not. Those who are set free and those who are in bondage. Those who are on the side of the water with Pharaoh in bondage and those who have crossed the sea and have come out in newness of life and are learning to be sanctified, preparing for His presence. I pray that everyone in this room and anyone that might hear this in the future would choose Him. It's a free gift. All you have to do is receive it and let Him change you as you cooperate. Hallelujah.